Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of The Enemy's Friend for Negroes Part 2. Remember, the nature and effects of that unhappy and disgraceful branch of commerce which has long been maintained on the coast of Africa with the sole and professed design of purchasing our fellow creatures in order to supply our West India islands and the American colonies when they were ours with slaves is now generally understood John Nelton in 1788 and it is from the book Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade published 1788 and we hope you know that John Nelton was the composer of the song Amazing Grace and he was a slave ship captain and he also composed the song How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sound and we hope you know that Jesus was the name of a British slave ship and from P. York and C. Talbot an opinion we are of opinion that a slave by coming from the West Indies to Great Britain or Ireland either with or without his master does not become free and that his master's property or right in him is not thereby determined or varied and that baptism doth not bestow freedom on him nor make any alteration in his temporal condition in these kingdoms we are also of opinion that the master may legally compel him to return again to the plantations and this was in january 14 1729 and these two people are the king's attorney and solicitor general in england and this is from the book a representation of the injustice and dangerous tendency of tolerating slavery or of admitting the least claim of private property in the presence of men in england in four parts containing remarks on an opinion given in the year 1729 by the then attorney general and solicitor general concerning the case of slaves in great britain this will help you understand the role of malami today in nigeria because they are fulanese the british has a policy of ruling through the fulanese so if you really want to understand what is going on everything the buhari impostor is talking about kano you have to read the history of the British and the slave trade. Everything will become very clear to you. And the book was written by Granville Sharp and published 1769. Negroes, Ethiopians, Africans, whichever name you choose for them. Did you read or observe months ago when the Aborigine wannabes were saying so-called African Americans were not African nor are they related to the Negroes in Africa? Do you also remember when we told you that the Aborigine narrative of people like Den Calloway or Krimo Ahau were fraudulent and sponsored by the slave master and his slave hunting accomplices? Have you then wondered why so-called African Americans were hired to protest to deny the killings by the slave master and his accomplices in Nigeria? Did you look at the placards they were carrying and the inscriptions on them did you notice that they were saying that the killings were not true and that they were propaganda now permit us to ask you do you think there were no nigerians that they could have brought to protest the same way the answer is certainly no there were nigerians but that protest is designed to achieve two things one to further create a divide between the Negroes in the diaspora or the so-called African Americans and the Negroes back home because people whose siblings were murdered in cold blood by the slave master and his accomplices will never be happy with what the so-called African Americans were doing so they will take it out on them it is the slave master's system of creating a divide between people he targets for his subjugation and in slavery and another reason they had to use so-called African Americans was because it is customary for the slave master to use Negroes against the Negroes and above all if they tried to use Nigerians some people may not want to participate because they know that the killings are going on so it would be unfair to them knowing that the killings were going on to join such a protest that's why the slave master had to use so-called African Americans. You need to bear in mind that the slave master is a subtle beast. Hypocrisy. Do you ever listen to debates 
in the plantation now called United States of America, especially during their presidential elections. And when candidates talk about late term abortion, mid term abortion, this abortion or that abortion or such things alike, and the evangelicals and other Christians and religious folks cheer them and say how well they are doing and how they are defending the faith and all that. But have you tried to compare that position with the fact that they supply the weapons with which people's parents, breadwinners, uncles, siblings are murdered in places like West and Central Africa, in a place like Nigeria for example. So ideally, they speak for the unborn babies while sponsoring the killing of the breadwinners elsewhere. So that is pure hypocrisy. And they understand the implication if you consider it in the light of the airplane safety tape where the mothers are usually told to fit their oxygen masks before that of the baby. And that's simply because common sense tells us that if the baby has the mask and the adult or the mother passes out, there is nothing the baby can do. Whereas if the adult has the mask and the baby passes out or something, it's easy for the adult to actually do something. It doesn't matter whether science or otherwise proves that babies survive longer than adults in such situations, we are just applying common sense to that narrative. So imagine that those presidents are cheered and celebrated for killing other people's parents, siblings, breadwinners, while at the same time pretending to be protecting the rights of unborn children. Looking back, in the Bible and Quran, the Europeans and Arabs can be said to have messages from their forebears. Why would Negroes read from the forebears of Europeans and Arabs even when such messages were used to enslave them? So please before you jump on to tell us how the books could have been written by some spirit or another, we want you to remember that without the slave trade, the Negroes wouldn't have gotten those books and they wouldn't have embraced those religions. So we need to bear that in mind and there is no way a spirit could write a book. And if you are a so-called African American, a Jamaican, Haitian, Black, Cuban, etc., learn from the pattern. Imagine if your child became a freedom seeker tomorrow, for example, for his people, and what guidance you can provide them to learn from people like Marcus Gavel, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., etc. Remember, something happened to all of them. They were all sabotaged, and the slave master knew to use a fellow Negro to sabotage them. A closer look at people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., it's easy to see that they ate the forbidden fruit of knowledge, and the slave master made sure something happened to them. And without a very good understanding of history, Negroes will continue to grope, and the slave master will continue his atrocities against them. The Media and Propaganda Did you ever try to understand what Malcolm X meant by how the media is able to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent? Make you love the oppressor and hate the oppressed? What do you think the Negroes were doing in the over 400 years that the slave trade lasted in that format back then? Did they just stand idly by and watched? Did they condemn the man stealers or pray to the slave master's God or Allah or the devil the slave master claimed they were worshipping back then? And so if you believed the Negroes could have sold themselves, that means they were actually enjoying the slave trade. That's just what it would mean. The Warren Chiefs today. Have you ever wondered why leaders in some communities in Africa who do not speak English would have an English title like chief? So you come to a community where people are not really educated. There were no English speakers so to speak, but the head in that community is a chief. Have you wondered how they embraced an English word to be used for their traditional rulers. That's because it is the slave master that appoints those people indirectly through his slave hunting accomplices in a place like Nigeria, for example. So do you remember the questions we asked about governor and rulers 
in what was Negro land and Guinea and in West and Central Africa today to be precise. And we asked you, when you see roads and schools broken like this, do you genuinely think those governors there do not want to fix those things? Remember, these are educated men and women and they are supposedly sensible adults who should know the right things to do. So do you in your heart of hearts believe that those governors do not want to do anything and somebody will be in office for eight years and achieve basically nothing? Do you think they do it deliberately? And remember, it is not one. It is something that has been repeating from whenever till today. So ask yourself, does it mean those people genuinely do not like their people or they won't like to build their place, but you will see them build their houses, make their compounds very beautiful, but they will never touch those roads. Have you wondered why they do that? So do you genuinely in your heart of hearts think that this governor here on your screen would like to sit on a pile of refuse the way this picture illustrates his position and his roads all in disrepair? You will see some of those emirs that go on Rolls Royce, which is a British product, and then they don't have good roads they can run on, which makes a mockery of the whole thing. But like we told you, it rubs off on them, not the slave master, because the slave master is the devil who speaks through the serpent. What about our question as to what could be the interest of the slave master in an election in a place like Anambra State? Remember, the British claim to be Great Britain. They claim to be first world countries. They claim to be beacons of freedom or whatever beautiful names they dress themselves on borrowed robes with. Our question to you is, why do you think they are interested in who wins an Anambra election? But then, they can't talk about Unandikano that did nothing. We want you to ask that question and go back in history, research it a little you will understand what we're talking about. So why do you think the slave master and his slave hunter accomplices impose those rulers you see in Africa? Do you remember in our last video where that user, Mr. Himself alone, was claiming that the Europeans recorded what they bought the slaves with? And we told you that he's all over the place just trying to defend the fact that it could have been a cell. Remember that? So we need to examine what he meant by what they bought the slaves with. Remember, those stories we are told at the time they claimed that the Negroes were not human. You need to bear that in mind. So the descendants of the slave hunters, because of their lack of humanity and common sense, their duty is to defend those lies to say this was how it actually happened. Remember, that's why the slave master puts them in positions of authority. And that's why you notice that if any Negro comes up to try to inform or educate his people, the slave master's propaganda machinery will enter overdrive. He will do all he can to demonize that person. For example, you see why Malcolm X said this. Whenever a black man cares for his people, empowering them and preaching truth, they will always focus on his mistakes, his flaws and his contradictions. They want to illegitimize his message, stop his progress and the hope for the people. So that is the same trick they used on Anandekan. If you remember, before they captured him, they told you he was preaching hate. He was the one bombing places. He was doing all kinds of evil. That's to justify what they were planning to do. If you were asked today who arrested or kidnapped or abducted Mazen Anandekan, you're going to say Nigerian government. You won't remember that it is the Fulani and the British people that did it. It doesn't matter how you try to color code it. It is the same group. They were the slave hunters. They don't have any feeling of humanity towards the Negroes. And above all, for those who come to attack us about Christianity and Islam, our position remains, if these things were true and could lead to anything called salvation, these people that have not allowed the Negroes breathe the air of freedom on earth here wouldn't have given it to them. And which will challenge you. It doesn't matter if you hold a PhD from Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT to prove to us that it is possible that those who cannot allow the Negroes freedom in their own land here on earth could have given them something that will give them better life elsewhere. It doesn't matter where it is. That's if we assumed, but without considering that any place called heaven existed. 
And so, to better understand how the slaves were really acquired, let us reference some historical account of Guinea, its situation, produce, and the general disposition of its inhabitants with an inquiry into the rise and progress of the slave trade, its nature and lamentable effects. Also, a republication of the sentiments of several authors of note on this interesting subject, particularly an extract of a treatise by Granville Sharp, and this was by Anthony Benezet, and it was published 1771. Here we see that about the year 1749, I sailed from Liverpool to the coast of Guinea. Some time after our arrival, I was ordered to go up the country a considerable distance upon having noticed from one of the Negro kings that he had a parcel of slaves to dispose of. I received my instructions and went, carrying with me an account of such goods we had on board to exchange for the slaves we intended to purchase. Upon being introduced, I presented him with a small case of English spirits, a gun, and some trifles which having accepted and understood by an interpreter what goods we had the next day was appointed for viewing the slaves. We found about 200 confined in one place, but here, how shall I relate the affecting sight I there beheld? How can I sufficiently describe the silent sorrow which appeared in the countenance of the afflicted father and the painful anguish of the tender mother, expecting to be forever separated from their tender offsprings, the distressed maid wringing her hands in presage of her future wretchedness and the general cry of the innocent from a fearful apprehension of the perpetual slavery to which they were doomed, under a sense of my offense to God, in the person of his creatures, I acknowledge I purchased eleven, who I conducted tied two and two to the ship, being but a small vessel, ninety ton. We soon purchased our cargo consisting of one hundred and seventy slaves, whom thou mayest read arrange in their view, as they were shackled two and two together, bent up within the narrow confines of the main deck, with the complicated distress of sickness, chains and contempt, deprived of every fond and social tie, and in a great measure reduced to a state of desperation. We had not been a fortnight at sea before the fatal consequence of their despair appeared. They formed the design of recovering their natural right, liberty, by rising and murdering every man on board. But the goodness of the Almighty rendered their scheme abortive, and His mercy spared us to have time to repent. So you see why in West and Central Africa today, people are sworn in by the Bible or the Quran because the slave master and his accomplices know there is no power in them. And if you doubt what we're saying, very simple common sense test would be, hypothetically speaking, if you gathered your children, get enough sheets of paper and they wrote everything in those books, in those sheets of paper, and you bind them together. If anyone took an oath with them, do you expect anything would happen? The answer is certainly no. So those are the subtle ways the slave master knows what games to play. So when you look at it, you think you have his words, but the slave master is a subtle beast. So from what we just read, you see that the gifts were just symbolic. There is no bargain, there is no sell. And part of what you need to understand will be what is coded in the so-called wisdom of Solomon and the two women. So we can see this coded in 1 Kings 3 and reading from verse 16 it says, Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. 
And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, while thy handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, the one said, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other said, Nay, but the son is the dead, and my son is the living. But that's not our interest. Our interest is in verse 24. And it says, And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Now, this is not any pure wisdom. It just gives you the code of how they know who owns what. They understand that the Negroes are not the same with these people. So that's why they kill them easily. Think about it yourself. In Britain, there is the Scottish independence agitation. Nobody is shooting the other over it. But in Biafra and in Ambazonia, the British are supplying weapons to those people to kill supposedly their siblings, even though we know we are not the same with them. So that should right there give you exactly what is going on. It doesn't matter if you believe us or not. One question you have to ask yourself is, what sensible person on earth will his brother say, I am hungry, I want my roads built, or I want to be free, and he takes guns and starts killing indiscriminately? Ask yourself that question. It tells you the whole story. And to better understand this in the light of our presentation, let us reference the Journal of Negro History, Kata G. Woodson, Editor, Volume 2, published 1917. Here we see that, But suddenly there was a mighty noise of crying and groaning, of calling at each other and bidding farewell to friends. Some were so overcome at the fear of being eaten that they rolled upon the ground and absolutely refused to work. Nothing could persuade them to get up until a guard came along with his great whip which brought blood at each lash. As the great army passed through the gate of the city, an officer of the Sultan examined every slave to be sure none was a Fatlata, that's a Fulani, Mohammedan or Jew. The guard caravan happened to have among its slaves a Fatlata who was at once discovered and set free. So we see clearly that they knew theirs and they were not capturing those who were not their own people. So you understand it. But their lack of humanity and common sense rubs off on all of us because today they'll keep telling you it's other Africans telling other Africans. Come to think of it, when you see Professor Gates showing you what he claims is a manifest of slave ships, you are overestimating the slave master. We challenge you today, go and bring the most educated professors you have in the UK, whether they're school in Oxford or wherever they like, bring them down to West and Central Africa. Let us bring 400 people randomly and give them their names, including with a translator or any number of translator you like. And let's watch them write the names of 400 to 500 to 1000 people including women and children, babies, and let's see how they could do it. Remember, they try to make you believe they could have written it then. But that's you because you think the slave master is super smart. But permit us to ask you, the reason he has what you call baptismal name today was because he couldn't pronounce the local names of the people. So he coined his baptismal name to tell people that if you don't change your name, 
to be like the slave master's name, then you won't have salvation, you won't make heaven and all that. Because he wanted a name he could pronounce. Then suddenly there is a professor Gates that the slave master is hiding behind as the biblical serpent and the devil. Speaking through Professor Gates to tell you that there was something called slave voyages and he has a slave ship manifest and all that, which is a very big lie. There is no way they could have gathered the names at that time because people with the same languages were not carried together in the same slave ship so that they don't mutiny. Now we challenge you to investigate what we're telling you. Apply your common sense to the narrative. The slave master is never that smart. So here in the manifest, for example, that Professor Gates is giving you, we hope they will also capture the name of this baby where it says, the next day the caravans were obliged to stop in consequence of a Negro woman who gave birth to a child. This stop, however, was not very lengthy. In a few hours, she and her infant were placed upon a camel and the caravan went forward. So if you remember when Mr. himself alone was talking about whether they were using camels or not that to take the slaves, the slaves were on foot. So the slave hunters will be on the camels. The same way you see them today, like the Nigerian army, they will come and kill innocent people. They move with their armored personnel carriers. It is the only army in the world that is designed to kill only its own people and controlled by foreigners. The slave master controls the Nigerian army. It's not controlled by the owners. So that's why you see that the slave master is a subtle beast. So on your screen, you see a video of where the slave hunting terror group that became Nigerian army in 1863 acquired 60 new armored personnel carriers. That's what they'll be using to kill innocent people. Remember, they lack humanity and they lack common sense. It doesn't matter if you believe us or not. Our little question to you would be, why do you think they don't use the money they used to buy these 60 armored personnel carriers that they will use to kill supposedly their own people to build one or two roads or schools that they claim they don't have money to build if the problem was money? If there were skilled labor and everything as you would imagine, these are things people could do themselves if allowed to. We challenge you, ask yourself why they are not using the monies they are using to buy heavy war machines to do that instead of killing people. You come out to say build our roads, they will shoot you. Remember IPOB for example tried to build the roads, they attacked them, started arresting them, attacked them terrorists and that's what you see today. So again we ask you. Why do you think those governors do not build those roads? But every year, they come with the same campaign promises, telling you how they make this and do that, which are all lies. But like we told you, the slave master is controlling all of them. They are the warrant chiefs.